Hello and welcome to the lecture on toxicology in the EMT curriculum. After you as an EMT student complete this chapter in all related coursework, you will be familiar with classes of compounds involved in substance abuse and poisoning, the routes by which poisons can enter the body, and the signs and symptoms and assessment and treatment for various poisoning emergencies. As we've stated before regarding the National EMS Education Standard competencies, as an EMT you will be able to apply the fundamental knowledge in order to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on your assessment findings for an acutely ill patient. Regarding toxicology, you will be able to recognize and manage carbon monoxide poisoning and nerve agent poisoning, as well as know how and when to contact poison control. Regarding the anatomy, physiology, pathophysiology, assessment and management of these things, you will understand and be able to appropriately assess and manage patients who have experienced inhaled poisonings, ingested poisonings, injected poisonings, and absorbed poisonings. And we include as a part of this separately though, alcohol intoxication and withdrawal. Each day we come into contact with things that are potentially poisonous. Almost any substance may be a poison in certain circumstances and different doses can turn even a rem remedy into a poison. The thing that you need to remember is something as simple as aspirin, which is a remedy for pain and, and other things. If it is taken inappropriately or if you have certain medical conditions, it can become a poison. Acute poisoning affects about 5 million children and adults each year and chronic poisoning is a much more common issue for us. Generally speaking, this is caused by things like abuse of medications, tobacco, alcohol, and drugs. Death rates by poisoning are fairly rare, and the rates of death as a result of poisoning in children have decreased significantly since the 1960s due to the advent of safety caps on bottles. However, deaths caused by poisoning in adults have been on the rise, and this is attributed to the result of drug abuse. Toxicology is the study of toxic or poisonous substances. A poison is any substance whose chemical action can damage body structures or impair body function. Poisons act by changing the normal metabolism of cells or by actually destroying them. Poisons may act acutely or chronically, and substance abuse is the misuse of any substance to produce a desired effect. A common complication of substance abuse is overdose, and this occurs when a patient takes a toxic dose of a drug. You as an EMT have the primary responsibility to your patient that has been poisoned to recognize that a poisoning has actually occurred. Sometimes we need to consider that very small amounts of poisons can cause significant damage or death and if you are suspicious that a poisoning has occurred, you need to notify medical control and start emergency treatment immediately. The signs and symptoms of poisoning vary according to the agent. The presence of such injuries at the patient's mouth strongly suggests an ingestion or swallowing of a poison. The chart here in table 19-1 shows toxidromes. It gives you typical signs and symptoms of specific overdoses and the agents are based on type. For example, opioids, which are narcotics, sympathomimetics, things like epinephrine or methamphetamine, or cocaine, sedative hypnotics like benzodiazepines and sedatives, also anticholinergics like atropine and jimson weed, and cholinergics like pilocarpine or nerve gas. The signs and symptoms for each agent is listed on the right. Please use this as a study guide to be very familiar with the agents and their signs and symptoms. If at all possible, you need to find out from your patient what substance did they ingest, when did they ingest it or become exposed to it? How much of it did you take? What actions have been taken and how much do you weigh? Weight is an important component of the history. You should also attempt to determine the nature of the poison. Look around the immediate area for overturned bottles, for needles or syringes, also scattered pills, chemicals, or even an overturned or damaged plant. You should place any suspicious material in a plastic bag and take it with you to the hospital containers at the scene can provide crucial information, things like the name and concentration of the drug, the ingredients of the drug, how many pills were originally in the bottle, and what is the prescribed dose for the patient. If your patient vomits, you need to examine the contents for pill fragments. It's a dirty job, but someone has to do it. 
you should wear the appropriate PPE and collect the vomitus in a plastic bag in order for it to be analyzed at the hospital. The most important treatment you can generally perform for a poisoning is the dilution or physical removal of the agent. Most often, you will not be administering a specific antidote because most poisons, poisons do not have one. How you provide treatment depends on how the poisoning actually got into the patient's body to begin with. The four avenues that we must consider are inhalation, absorption or surface contact, ingestion, or injection. As you can see here, the four examples are shown. Injection can be the most worrisome in terms of treatment because it is difficult to remove or, reduce or dilute the poison. It is immediately entering the bloodstream, or at least very quickly, depending on how it was injected, and it makes it very difficult to reverse. All routes of poisoning can be deadly, and should be, each be, should be thought of as being equally serious. Always contact medical control before you proceed with the treatment of any poisoning victim. Inhaled poisonings. The patient must be moved into fresh air immediately and may require supplemental oxygen. If you are involved in the removal of the patient, you should always use SCBA to protect yourself from the poisonous fumes. Some patients may need decontamination after they've been removed from the toxic environment. If you are not trained, you need a specific rescue unit to do this for you. You need to remember that the patient's clothing should be removed in this process because it may contain trapped gases that can be released which expose you to the toxin as well. All patients who have inhaled poisons require immediate transport to an emergency department. You need to be prepared to use supplemental oxygen via a non-rebreather mask or ventilatory support with a bag mask device if necessary. You also need to make sure a suctioning unit is available in case the patient vomits, and you should take containers, bottles, and labels with you when you transport patients to the hospital. Patients sometimes attempt to commit suicide in a vehicle by leaving the engine running in an enclosed garage. The exhaust fumes contain high levels of carbon monoxide, and that will cause the patient to lose consciousness and eventually stop breathing. A recent variation involves using a tightly sealed vehicle as a type of gas chamber and when you open the door it is possible that you will be overcome by carbon monoxide as well and you should contact hazmat responders and have them remove the victim remember if you're not trained in rescue call your appropriate resource absorbed and surface contact poisons can affect the patient in many different ways they can cause skin damage chemical burns rashes or lesions and systemic body effects it is important to distinguish between contact burns and contact absorption. Some of the signs and symptoms of absorbed poisonings include a history of exposure, liquid or powder on the patient's skin, burns, itching, and irritation, and typical odors of the substance. Emergency treatment for a typical contact poisoning includes the following steps. Avoid contaminating yourself or others. While protecting yourself, remove the substance from the patient as quickly as possible. Remove all contaminated clothing and flush and wash the patient's skin. If a large amount of material has been spilled on your patient, you should flood the affected part for at least 20 minutes with copious amounts of water. If your patient has a chemical agent in their eyes, you need to irrigate them quickly and thoroughly for at least 5 to 10 minutes for acid-based substances and 15 to 20 minutes for alkalis. You need to make sure the fluid runs from the bridge of the nose outward in order to keep eyes from cross-contaminating or from an uninjured eye being contaminated. Many chemical burns occur in an industrial setting. You should not try to neutralize substances on the skin with additional chemicals. Wash the substance off immediately with plenty of water and obtain information regarding the chemical or the um, exposure incident from material safety data sheets. These should be transported with your patient to the hospital. The only time you should not irrigate the contact area with water is when a patient has been contaminated with a poison that reacts violently to water. This is not something we might immediately know, which is why the MSDS sheets are critically important. You should brush the chemical off, remove the contaminated clothing, and apply a dry dressing to the burn. Wear appropriate protective gloves and the proper protective clothing and provide prompt transport to the emergency department. Ingested poisons are um, 
where poisons come into the body by mouth, and about 80% of all poisonings occur in this manner. These include things like drugs, liquids, household cleaners, contaminated food, and plants. Ingested poisoning is usually accidental in children, but it is deliberate in adults. Some of the signs and symptoms vary greatly with the type of poisoning and the age of the patient and how long of a time has elapsed since the ingestion of the poisoning. Your goal as an EMT is to provide rapid removal of much, as much poison as possible from the gastrointestinal tract, and further care will be provided in the emergency department. In the past, in EMS, we used syrup of Ipecac, and that induced vomiting. Generally speaking, we do not use it today because of the danger of the patient aspirating vomitus if they become unconscious or have a decreased level of consciousness. Many EMS systems do still use activated charcoal. It comes as a suspension that binds to the poison in the stomach and carries it out of the system without it being absorbed into the bloodstream. It is more effective and safer than syrup of Ipecac, but you must realize it is activated charcoal and it is exactly what it sounds. You should always immediately assess airway, breathing, and circulation of every patient who has experienced a poisoning event. Injected poisonings occur as the result of generally drug abuse such as heroin and cocaine. The only other parties likely to have injected a patient with poisoning are insects and animals. The signs and symptoms can have a multitude of presentations and they may include weakness, dizziness, fever, chills, unresponsiveness, and excitability. Injected poisonings are impossible to dilute or remove because they are usually absorbed quickly into the body or can cause intense local tissue destruction. You must monitor airway, provide high flow oxygen, and be alert for nausea and vomiting. Patients should be promptly transported to the emergency department as this is an essential component of their treatment. And we should take all containers, bottles, and labels with us to the hospital. Patient assessment. You've heard this in every lecture that I've done. We perform it the same way. Scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. Scene safety. A well-trained dispatcher is of great value in these types of incidents to help you determine how many patients are involved, whether additional resources are needed, whether trauma is involved. If this information is not obtained before you arrive on scene, you must assess the scene thoroughly to ensure your own safety and determine the nature of the illness or the mechanism of the injury, the number of patients involved, the need for additional resources, and whether spinal immobilization is required. Use the appropriate PPE to avoid contamination of yourself and your crew. You need to examine the mechanism of injury or the nature of the illness. The dispatcher may give you important information about a poisoning call. If this information is not obtained before you arrive, look for clues and ask yourself the following. Do I see any medication bottles lying around the patient in the scene? If I do, is there medication missing that might be an overdose? Do I see any evidence of the presence of alcoholic beverage containers? Do I see any syringes or other drug paraphernalia? Is there any unpleasant or odd odor in the room? If so, is my scene safe? Is there a suspicious odor or drug paraphernalia present that may indicate the presence of a drug lab? This is a very important thing because these are extremely hazardous. Primary assessment. Form your general impression. You must obtain a general impression of your patient, and you can do this from your doorway assessment. Assess level of consciousness and determine any life threats. Do not be fooled into thinking that a conscious, alert, and oriented patient is in stable condition. This may deteriorate rapidly. Evaluate airway and breathing. You need to quickly ensure that the airway is open and ventilations are adequate. Do not hesitate to begin oxygen therapy and you should consider inserting an airway adjunct if your patient is unresponsive. Also, consider the potential for spinal injury. Assess the patient's circulatory status. You may find variations depending on what substance is involved and assess both pulse and skin color, temperature, and condition. Make your transport decision. Scene delays to further assess and treat patients are rarely indicated. 
You need to consider decontamination of the patient prior to transport, and this depends on the poisoning the patient was exposed to. It is especially important if your transfer is occurring via air medical. Take your history. Investigate your chief complaint and get the patient's medical history. If your patient is responsive, begin with an evaluation of the exposure and get the sample history. If your patient is not responsive, try, if you, try to find out information about the history from other sources, such as friends, family members, medical alert jewelry, or wallet cards. When you get your sample history, it guides you in what to focus on as you continue to assess your patient complaints. In addition to sample, you should ask the following questions. What is the substance that was involved? When did the patient ingest or become exposed to it? How much did the patient ingest or what was the level of exposure? Also, consider what period, over what period the patient took the substance. Has the patient or a bystander performed any interventions and did the intervention cause any help? How much does your patient weigh? As I stated before, this is an important part of treating for poisonings. Perform your secondary assessment. The secondary assessment is a more detailed, comprehensive exam of your patient and it is used to uncover issues that you may have missed during the primary assessment. The physical exam may focus on an area of the body involved with the poisoning or the route of exposure. Once you have addressed your ABCs and managed everything in your primary assessment, by conducting a thorough physical, you will be able to provide additional information on the exposure. It is important to perform a general review of all body systems that may help identify systemic related problems. Many poisons produce no outward indications of the seriousness of the exposure and alterations in the level of consciousness, heart rate, respiratory rate, blood pressure, and skin are the more sensitive indicators we see that something ser is seriously wrong with your patient. Reassess. Continually reassess the adequacy of airway breathing and circulation. Evaluate the effectiveness of interventions you are providing and repeat the assessment of vital signs if your patient is stable every 15 minutes. However, it should be done every 5 minutes or constantly if your patient has consumed a harmful or lethal dose. Check your interventions. Supporting ABCs is your most important task. Dilute airborne exposures with oxygen and remove contact exposures with copious amounts of water unless this is contraindicated. You could consider activated charcoal for ingested poisons and con contact medical control or a poison control center to discuss appropriate treatment options. Report as much information as you have about the poison to the hospital and if the poisoning or exposure occurred in a work setting, bring or have the company fax the MSDS to the hospital. The next section we're going to talk about is emergency medical care. It is important in poisonings and toxicology that we ensure scene safety, follow standard precautions, and perform an external, external decontamination of the patient. You need to remove tablets or fragments from within the patient's mouth and wash or brush the poison from the patient's skin. Assess and maintain the patient's airway breathing and circulation. Provide oxygen and assist ventilations if it's needed. And if the patient demonstrates signs and symptoms of shock, you need to position them in the supine position and elevate their feet, keep them warm, provide them with supplemental oxygen, and transport promptly to the nearest appropriate facility. If it is approved by medical control, you may give activated charcoal to patients who are alert and conscious. Activated charcoal is not indicated for patients who have ingested an acid, an alkali, or any petroleum product if they have a decreased level of consciousness and cannot protect their airway or they are unable to swallow. Activated charcoal absorbs or sticks to many commonly ingested poisons and it prevents the toxin from being absorbed into the body by the stomach or the intestines. If you carry activated charcoal and can use it, you will likely carry it in plastic bottles of a premixed suspension, each containing up to 50 grams of activated charcoal. Some of the common trade names are Instachar, Actidose, and Liquichar. The usual dose for an adult or child is one gram of activated charcoal per kilogram of body weight. Generally, we give 25 to 50 grams for an adult and 12 and a half to 25 grams for children. Before you give a patient charcoal, you must obtain approval from medical control. Next, you need to shake the bottle vigorously to mix the suspension. You may need to persuade the patient to drink it, but you should never force it. 
A major side effect of ingesting activated charcoal is black charcoal-like stools, and if the patient has ingested a poison that causes nausea, they may vomit after they take the activated charcoal. And if this happens, you will need to repeat your dose. We're going to talk about some specific poisons. Generally speaking, over time, a person who routinely misuses a substance may need increasing amounts of it to achieve the same result. This is called developing a tolerance to the substance. If the individual has an addiction or they have an overwhelming desire or need to continue using the substance at whatever cost with a tendency to increase the dose, this is an addiction and also tolerance. You must realize that almost any substance may be abused. The importance of safety awareness and standard precautions in caring for victims of drug abuse cannot be stressed enough. Known drug abusers have a fairly high incidence of serious and undiagnosed infections, including HIV and hepatitis. You should always wear the appropriate personal protective equipment and expect the unexpected. Remember, the drug user, not the drug, can pose the greatest threats. We're going to talk about alcohol first. It is the most commonly abused drug in the United States, and it kills more than 200,000 people every year. Alcoholism is one of the greatest national health problems along with heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Alcohol abuse can result in many long-term effects. The most common effect is liver damage and 90% of people who drink heavily will develop some level of hepatitis. 10 to 20% of alcoholics develop cirrhosis. Other long-term effects include increased incidences of pancreatitis, development of erosive gastritis, and increased risk for breast or colorectal cancer, and long-term abuse leading to atrophy of the cerebrum resulting in permanently reduced mental function. Alcohol decreases the ability to respond to sexual stimulation and long-term use can lead to impotence and sterility. Alcohol is a powerful CNS depressant. It is a sedative substance that decreases activity and excitement. It is also a hypnotic which means it induces sleep. A lot of people think that it is a stimulant. It's not. It's a depressant. It does reduce your inhibitions and makes you more likely to do things you wouldn't normally do, but it is a sedative hypnotic. In general, alcohol dulls the sense of awareness, slows your reflexes, and reduces your reaction time. It may also cause aggressive and inappropriate behavior and lack of coordination. And it may also, um, a person who appears intoxicated may have other medical problems as well. You should look for signs of head trauma, toxic reactions, or uncontrolled diabetes. Severe acute alcohol ingestion may cause hypoglycemia, and you should assume that all intoxicated patients are experiencing a drug overdose and require a thorough examination by a physician. Alcohol potentates many other drugs and is commonly not the only drug the patient has ingested. If a patient exhibits signs of serious CNS depression, you must provide respiratory support. Depression of the respiratory system may also cause emesis or vomiting, and the vomiting may be very forceful or even bloody because large amounts of alcohol do irritate the lining of the stomach. Internal bleeding should be also be considered if the patient appears to be in shock. You must know that patients in alcohol withdrawal may experience frightening hallucinations or delirium tremens, also known as DTs. This syndrome is characterized by agitation and restlessness, fever, sweating, tremors, confusion or disorientation, delusions or hallucinations, and seizures. These conditions may develop if patients no longer have their daily source of alcohol, and you must provide prompt transport and reassure the patient and provide them with emotional support. Opioids. Some common opioid drugs are listed in Table 19-2. Opioids are named for the opium in poppy seeds, the, and they are the origin of heroin, codeine, and morphine. Synthetic opioids include meperidine, also known as Demerol, hydromorphone, also known as Dilaudid, and oxycodone hydrochloride, also known as Oxycontin. Many addicts may have started using many of the opioids with an appropriate medical prescription. These agents are CNS depressants and can cause severe respiratory depression. Tolerance develops quickly, so some users may require massive doses to experience the same high. These drugs often cause nausea and vomiting and may lead to the development of hypotension. Although seizures are uncommon, they may occur. Patients typically appear sedated or unconscious and cyanotic with pinpoint pupils. Pinpoint pupils are the most commonly accepted sign of opiate abuse. 
Treatment includes supporting the airway and breathing. You should always open the airway, give supplemental oxygen, and be prepared for vomiting. Do not attempt any home remedies, for example, applying ice to the groin or forcing milk into the mouth. Be aware that someone else may have attempted inappropriate methods of resuscitation, and you will have to manage these as well. The only effective antidote is certain narcotic antagonists such as naloxone, also called Narcan. If you give this IV, patients will respond within two minutes, and it can be given IM. It is usually administered by paramedics or by physicians, but it is in the protocol in Montana for advanced EMTs. Sedative hypnotics. Barbiturates and benzodiazepines are easy to obtain and relatively cheap. These drugs are also CNS depressants and they alter the level of consciousness and effect, have the same effects that are similar to alcohol. The patient may appear drowsy, peaceful, or intoxicated. In general, these agents are taken by mouth. Occasionally, the capsules are suspended or dissolved in water and injected. Sedative hypnotic drugs quickly induce tolerance, so the person requires increasingly larger doses. These drugs may also be given to unsuspecting people as a knockout drink or a Mickey Finn. Generally, your treatment is to provide airway clearance, ventilatory assistance, and prompt transport. Benzodiazepine antidotes may be administered in the hospital, and this is called flumazenil, also known as rumazicon, and it is given intravenously. This is not a pre-hospital drug in Montana. Abused inhalants. Abused inhalants are inhaled instead of ingested or injected, as the name sounds. Some of the more common agents include acetone, toluene, xylene, and hexane. And back in the 60s and 70s, model airplane glue was high on the list. We find these chemicals in glues, cleaning compounds, paint thinners, and lacquers. Gasoline and various halogenated hydrocarbons, such as freon, that are used in propellants and aerosol sprays are also abused as inhalants. These are commonly abused by teenagers, and the effective dose and the lethal dose are very close, making these extremely dangerous drugs. You should always use special care in dealing with a patient who may have used inhalants. Halogenated hydrocarbon solvents can make the heart hypersensitive to the patient's own adrenaline. Even the action of walking may cause a fatal ventricular arrhythmia. You should use a stretcher to move the patient, give oxygen, and transport them to the hospital. Sympathomimetics. Sympathomimetics are CNS stimulants that mimic the effects of the sympathetic nervous system. These stimulants frequently cause hypertension, tachycardia, and dilated pupils. Uh, some of the street names and drug names are on the table 19-4 for your information. A stimulant is an agent that produces an excited state. Common examples include amphetamines, methamphetamine, crack cocaine, ecstasy, fen-fen, MDA, and speed. Designer drugs, such as Ecstasy and Eve, are also frequently abused in certain areas of the United States. Cocaine, for example, can be taken in a number of different ways. It can be absorbed through all mucous membranes and even across the skin. The immediate effects of a given dose last less than an hour. And if you smoke crack, it produces the most rapid means of absorption and therefore the most potent effect. Cocaine is one of the most addicting substances known. Its immediate effects include excitement and euphoria. An acute overdose is a genuine emergency, and you should be aware that severe agitation can lead to tachycardia and hypertension. Patients may be paranoid, and this may place you at risk. Law enforcement officers should restrain the patient if necessary, and do not leave the patient unattended during transport. All of these patients need prompt transport because of the risk of seizures, cardiac arrhythmias, and stroke. Marijuana. It is abused throughout the world, and as many as 20 million people use it daily in the United States. By inhaling marijuana, it produces euphoria, relaxation, and drowsiness. It impairs short-term memory and the capacity to do complex thinking and work. The euphoria could progress to depression and confusion. Marijuana use rarely necessitates transport to the hospital. The exception is for a patient who is hallucinating, is very anxious, or paranoid. You should reassure the patient and transport with a minimum amount of excitement. 
Marijuana is often used as a vehicle to get other drugs into the body. Hallucinogens. Commonly abused list on Table 19-5. Hallucinogens alter a person's sensory perceptions. The classic is lysergic acid diethylamide, LSD. That is the classic. Also, abuse of PCP is relatively uncommon among young adults these days, though in the 60s and 70s it was fairly common. Fencyclidine is a dissociative anesthetic that is easily synthesized and highly potent. These agents cause visual hallucinations, intensify vision and hearing, and generally separate the user from reality. Patients experiencing a bad trip will be hypersensitive, tachycardic, anxious, and paranoid. Your care is the same as that for a patient who has taken a sympathomimetic. You need to be calm and professional in your demeanor, provide emotional support, do not use restraints unless you, and the patient, you or the patient are in danger of injury, and watch your patient carefully throughout transport, and you need to provide reassurance and request ALS assistance. Anticholinergics. The classic picture of a person who has taken too much of an anticholinergic medication is hot as a hair, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, red as a beet, and mad as a hatter. These medications have the properties that block the parasympathetic nerve. Common drugs include atropine, Benadryl, and Jimson weed. With the exception of Jimson weed, these medications usually are not abused. You can see in the animation the effect. We'll play it again. Some tricyclic antidepressants have significant anticholinergic effects, and death from these agents can be rapid. The patient can go from appearing normal to seizure and death within 30 minutes. These patients need to be transported immediately, and the seizures and arrhythmias are best to be treated in the hospital. Cholinergics include nerve gases designed for chemical warfare, insecticides, and some types of wild mushrooms. These agents overstimulate normal body function that are controlled by the parasympathetic nerves, and they result in salivation, mucus secretion, urination, crying, and an abnormal heart rate. The signs and symptoms of cholinergic drug poisoning are easy to remember with the mnemonic dumbbells. Defecation, urination, meiosis, which is constriction of the pupils, bronchorrhea, which is discharge of mucus from the lungs, emesis, lacrimation, or tearing, and salivation. These symptoms are listed here. Alternatively, and this is more common here, we use the mnemonic sludge. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI irritation, and eye constriction, and emesis. The most important consideration is to avoid exposure yourself. Decontamination may take priority over immediate transport, and your priorities after decontamination are to decrease the secretions in the mouth and trachea and provide airway support. Antidote kits may be available. The most common of these antidotes are the Mark I kit or the Duodote kit, and we will talk more about these during the lecture on terrorism when we do the operations section. Indications include a known exposure to nerve agents or organophosphates with manifestation of the signs and symptoms. The kit consists of an auto-injector of atropine and one of 2-PAM chloride. Other miscellaneous drugs. Accidental or intentional overdose with cardiac medications has become a common occurrence. Children may ingest them thinking they are candy. The signs and symptoms will depend on the medication ingested. You should contact poison control as soon as possible as this is very important. It is likely you will be given order, an order to administer activated charcoal. The other thing we must remember is that aspirin poisoning remains a potentially lethal condition. Ingesting too many may result in nausea, vomiting, hyperventilation, and ringing in the ears. Patients with this problem are frequently anxious, confused, tachypnic, and hypothermic. 
and they are also in danger of, sorry, hyperthermic, and they are in danger of having seizures. Overdosing with acetaminophen is also very common. It is generally not toxic, however, symptoms of an overdose generally do not appear until it is too late. Gathering information at the scene is very important, and you need to be extremely careful in dealing with a child who has ingested a poisonous substance. Some alcohols, including methyl alcohol and ethylene glycol, are even more toxic than ethyl alcohol, which is drinking alcohol. Both will cause severe tachypnea, blindness, renal failure, and eventually death. Immediate transport to the emergency department is essential. And ethylene glycol, you need to know this is the ingredient found in antifreeze. And we do see instances of both accidental and intentional ethylene glycol poisoning in the Flathead Valley. Food poisoning. Food poisoning is almost always caused by eating food contaminated by bacteria. There are two main types of food poisoning. The organism itself may cause the disease, or the organism may produce toxins that cause disease. A toxin is a poison or harmful substance produced by bacteria, animals, or plants. One organism that produces direct, direct effects of food poisoning is salmonella. You see in this chart on your left a list of common sources of food poisoning. Salmonellosis is characterized by severe GI symptoms within 72 hours of ingestion, including nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, and diarrhea. Proper cooking kills bacteria, and proper cleanliness in the kitchen prevents the contamination of uncooked foods. The more common cause of food poisoning is the ingestion of powerful toxins produced by bacteria, often in leftovers. The bacterium Staphylococcus is quick to grow and produce toxins in food. Foods prepared with mayonnaise when left unrefrigerated are a common vehicle. These result in sudden GI symptoms including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Symptoms usually start within 2-3 to three hours after ingestion or as long as 8-12 to 12 hours after ingestion. The most severe form of toxin ingestion is botulism. It can result from eating improperly canned food and the spores of Clostridium bacteria grow and produce a toxin. The symptoms are neurologic and cause such things as blurring of vision and weakness, as well as difficulty in speaking or breathing. Often, fatal symptoms may develop within the first 24 hours after ingestion or as long as four days later. In general, you should not try to determine the specific, specific cause of acute GI problems. Get as much history as possible from the patient, transport them promptly to the hospital, and if you have two or more persons in one group that have the same illness, you should take along some of the suspected food. Plant poisoning. There are several thousand cases of plant poisoning annually. Many household plants are poisonous if ingested, and some cause skin irritation. Some can affect the circulatory system, the GI tract, or the central nervous system. It is impossible to memorize every plant and poison, let alone their effects. You can and should do the following. Assess the patient's airway and vital signs. Notify the Regional Poison Control Center for assistance in identifying the plant. Take the plant to the emergency department and provide prompt transport of your patient. Here we have just different pictures of plants that cause issues. And again, more pictures. Irritation of the skin and or the mucous membranes is a problem with the common house plant called Diphenbacca. Emergency medical treatment includes maintenance of the airway, providing supplemental oxygen, and transport promptly to the hospital for respiratory support. Emer poisons are acutely or chronically, I apologize, poisons act acutely or chronically to destroy or impair body cells. If you believe a patient may have been um, ingesting or taking a poisonous substance, you should support their ABCs and notify medical control. Management also entails collecting any evidence of the type of poison that was used and taking it to the hospital, diluting and physically removing the poisonous agent, providing respiratory support, and transporting the patient promptly. Emergency treatment may include administration of an antidote, usually in the hospital if there is an antidote in existence. A poison can be introduced into the body by inhalation, absorption, ingestion, or injection. It is difficult to remove or dilute injected poisons, a fact that makes these cases especially urgent. Always consult medical control before you proceed with the treatment of any poisoning victim. 
Move patients who have inhaled poison into the fresh air. Be prepared to use supplemental oxygen via a non-rebreather or provide ventilatory support with a bag mask device. With absorbed or surface contact poisonings, be sure to avoid contaminating yourself. You should remove all contaminated substances and clothing from the patient and flood the affected part with water. About 80% of all poisonings are by ingestion, including plants, contaminated food, and most drugs. In general, activated charcoal should be used on these patients. People who have abused a substance can de develop a tolerance to it or can develop an addiction. The most commonly abused drug in the United States is alcohol. It can depress the central nervous system and can cause respiratory depression. You must support the airway in such cases and be prepared for the patient to vomit. Opioids, sedative hypnotics, and abused inhalants can also depress the central nervous system and can cause respiratory depression. Take special care with patients who have used inhalants because the drugs may cause seizures or even sudden death. Sympathomimetics, including cocaine, stimulate the central nervous system, causing hypertension, tachycardia, seizures, and pupil dilation. Patients who have taken these drugs may be paranoid, as may patients who have taken hallucinogens. Anticholinergics, often taken in suicide attempts, can cause a person to become hot, dry, blind, red-faced, and mentally unbalanced. An overdose of tricyclic antidepressants can lead to cardiac arrhythmias. The symptoms of cholinergic medications can be remembered by using the mnemonic dumbbells for excessive defecation, urination, meiosis, bronchiorrhea, emesis, lacrimation, and salivation, or sludge for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, GI irritation, and eye constriction or emesis. Two main types of food poisoning cause GI symptoms. In one, bacteria in the food directly cause disease, such as salmonellosis. In the other, bacteria such as staphylococcus produce powerful toxins. The most severe form of toxin ingestion is botulism. The first neurologic symptoms may appear as late as four days after ingestion. Plant poisonings can affect the circulatory system, the GI system, and the central nervous system. Some plants irritate the skin or mucous membranes and may cause airway obstruction. Thanks for your attention, and as always, please bring questions to class with your instructor.